seen a little bit about us as a species. Um, you know, right now, we are waging a war against nature. And we have done ever since the Industrial Revolution. We have gone at nature like at this crazy pace. And we continue to do that. We continue to find a way in which we can destroy it. And yet, we don't recognize how we're destroying it because we are so detached from it. I mean, if I asked anyone, who hates nature? Anyone in here hate nature? Occasionally, <laughs> someone goes, yeah, me. I mean, there's certain things, like mosquitoes, kind of annoying. Um, you know, you're like, yeah, maybe that bit of nature I don't like. You know, but it's like no one hates nature, yet we attack it like we hate it, like it's our enemy, like it's our God-given right to just go after it and destroy it. And so we are now at this point where we are literally destroying it. And, and, and you, know, you, you know, when you go out and you look for sort of uh, answers around this, I mean, it's interesting. I'm, I'm a big fan of Google, so I thought, well, let's see what the, the general pulse on nature is. Um, and it's, it doesn't surprise me that um, when you tap in what is nature, the first thing that comes up is nature is Satan's church. It's kind of like, what? You know, and I didn't, even, I, I didn't even like Photoshop that or anything. I couldn't even make that up. I like the fact that... It's like nature is island tropical gourmet makes it into there as well. But it's like nature is Satan's church. So I want to use this opportunity to say, if this is Satan's church, I am a devil worshiper. I will do it now. I love Satan. Look at this. I mean, you know, it's like, come on, let's get real about this. We, you know, we don't hate nature, but we're waging a war against it. We look at it as a sort of externalized commodity that's out there. Um, but on a serious note, I mean, I think what we have to focus on are what I call these human fingerprints. One of the most noticeable is what we're here today to discuss, which is plastic prints everywhere. These are undeniable. Species loss, undeniable. You know, lack of, of, of fresh drinking water, undeniable. You know, urbanization, undeniable. I mean, these are things that we as individuals are all part of. We're all contributing to. No matter how good we are, we're all part of a system that was built when we thought we had cheap fuel and infinite resources. And we're now caught up with ourselves. We're like this, you know, we walk around the world thinking we could just consume, 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 and then we've suddenly bumped into ourselves. And we're now seeing the destruction of our everyday habits. In a way, I kind of, I like this, it's kind of like we're playing a game of death Jenga. Everyone know the game Jenga? It's kind of like that, right? So we've got, imagine we've got this like game and, and every single block is a species or a system or part of this incredible cacophony that makes up this beautiful planet. And every time we pull one of those bricks out, the thing kind of gets a little more wobbly. And we all know that when you play Jenga, it doesn't just gently drop, oh, I'm going to fall now. It doesn't go, oh, OK, hang on, hang on, I'm falling. You know, it just collapses. And the crazy thing is that we're pulling out these, these blocks that we don't even know what they do yet. It's crazy to me to think that we live on a planet with millions of species, yet we only have maybe a couple of hundred thousand that we really, really know a lot about. We give them all names. We apparently have explored our planet. But we're very, very, very early in actually exploring our understanding of who we are on this planet and what these systems do. But it's crazy that we keep on pulling them out. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, and when it comes to creating change, the question we have to ask ourselves is, why are we sweeping these issues just under the carpet? Why do we ignore it? Why do we continue? I mean, we are failing ourselves. We're failing our children and their children and their children and how many other generations have come, but we are currently failing. I'd love to say we're winning, but we're not. We're doing some amazing work, but the rate of destruction is outweighing the work that we're doing as individuals, and it's becoming a major issue for us because we just keep on sweeping it under the carpet. I have to say that one of the things that really gets me and has got me for a while, and I can't get my head around it, but we've become obsessed by this word climate change. And what's happened with climate change, and this is one of the reasons why I think we are sweeping things under the carpet, is someone managed to put that word debate on the end. Whenever you see the word climate change, it's the debate. It's not a debate, right? There's no debate about it, but we've got sucked into it, so our energy is focused on debating. Debating what? How much? Who much? Who did that? Who did what? We, we've got sucked into this debate. So one thing I would say is like, ignore the debate. Do what you're doing. Focus on what I was saying, those human fingerprints, those undeniable factors, the water loss, the species loss, the ocean degradation, the plastic issue. It's undeniable. We have to let go of climate change, not in the sense of like, let's just be frivolous and say climate change doesn't exist, but it exists, it's real, but don't get drawn into that thing of it's a debate, it's a lie, and we're doing it. So we have to, I think that's the first major thing. The second thing for me is that we've got to a point now where nature is out there. 
And I say that in the sense that we look at nature as something that's outside the window. I mean, I love being right here right now, but you go out there and you're in your little perfect little bit of nature and I feel really safe, you know? Because for the most part, nature to us is seen as unruly and chaotic and it's out there and it's all different complex systems that intimidate us. The irony is we are part of that. We're part of the web of life. We're one of those species. There's 200 species a day going disappearing. We may have nicer clothes and little controllers and sit in nice chairs, but we are one of those species. But we yet, we look at nature as something over there. We look at it as something completely externalized to us. And if you actually look at the landscape and you look at our everyday actions, it's kind of extraordinary. I mean, the, 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 the sort of the, the signs for this are just so present. Um, you know, this is a great example. The number one selling bug spray in the US is called off. Imagine, God forbid, another species would land on me. You know, it's like you get a loyalty card from rent -a kill for killing species. It's like kill five bugs, three rats, and a, and a, and a, and a you know, wombat, and we'll give you loyalty points. Like, we've totally gone nuts. When you think about it, <laughs> you know, our perception of nature, and one of the reasons why we look at nature in this sort of, sort of idealistic way is because we're using nature, oddly enough, to sell products and services. We see it always as this pristine, I mean, I love the fact that, you know, diesel genes down the bottom here, you know, and everyone's in nature, and nature's like this Eden. So our reality of nature starts to shift. We start to look at nature in a different light. I love the fact up here, it's Pepsi, dare more, with the most perfect wave. Dare more might be to stop your plastic ending up in the ocean. That might be something to dare more about. But we see nature through this lens of sort of advertising, where it's, you know, it's seen as sort of being you know, incredibly sort of pristine. I love this. We start to use nature more and more now in our advertising and our marketing. I don't know if a squirrel can drive, but apparently he's recommending Renault. You know, he's like, <laughs> as recommended by nature. I've never seen a squirrel drive. If he could, maybe a Renault would suit him. I don't know, or her. But I love this one here. The soda nature would drink if nature drank soda. I mean, like, we are going so far down the line, it's insane. I mean, it's like, really? And I love this. It's the most refreshing thing since me, signed Lake. You know, I mean, it's like the, the absolute crap that we are pushing on ourselves. But our imagery that we're left with is that it's this. And what we're not seeing is the fact that it's degrading and our forests are disappearing and our lakes are drying up and our oceans are filling with plastic. But in our head, everything's great and we're using nature in the, in the most absurd way. I love the fact that when you walk into a, a hotel and, and, and someone at the desk says, oh, hello, sir, uh, would you like the ocean view room? It'll be a little bit more expensive. Or you can have the park view. It's a little bit more expensive. And we, we all sort of go, oh, yeah, that sounds nice. I'll do that. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But we won't actually go out into nature. We'll have it there out the window and we'll look at it, but we'll pay more for it. And if you start to go through your everyday life and you start to see your touch points of nature, you start to realize how abstract we've made nature. I love this. I call this nature porn, right? The fastest growing content on television is wildlife movies. And we all sit at home where we can control nature with a little thing and we go, yep. I mean, I haven't been to the park and ever seen a duck falling out of a tree, right? <laughs> And so you go out into nature and it seems positively boring. You go for a walk down the beach and you want to see whales and you want to see all these things. So we're starting to paint this totally fake you know, system of nature. I spent four months on the ocean on Plastiki and I did not see that. I didn't see dolphins. I didn't see whales. I had two sightings in four months. Two sightings. It was empty. But so when we look at it, we see it as this abundant thing. And we look at it and we go, wow. And then we go out and we're like, well, this is a bit boring. So what we do is we buy nice gear and we call it going on a hike. It's really a walk. Um, but we start to kind of delude ourselves. Um, I love this. This is in Japan. There's a thing called the Ocean Dome. They built this $300 million invested. I mean, this is like the height of what I call our nature defiancy disorder, which was a play on nature deficiency disorder. But my computer's much smarter than me, and it changed nature defiancy to, de to deficiency. And I, this is the prime example. $300 million, retractable roof. The sand is just like the real thing. It's made of marble, but doesn't stick to the skin. Brilliant, brilliant. All this litany of great things. It's built 300 yards away from the real beach. It's like, you could even, it's like, let's go up onto the balcony, onto the second floor, and have a look at nature from out of there. I mean, like, that is how absurd this situation has got. So I guess why I'm here today and why we're all here today is ultimately what we're trying to do is give nature a voice. We're trying to stand up for nature. We, have to, we know what we're battling against. Those are just a few examples of the thousands 
where we're sort of deluded. We're, there's a false sense of reality around what nature is to us and how we interact with it. Let's not forget we are a species. We are part of the web of life. Everything we do, touch, taste, wear, everything comes from nature. It is our foundation, full stop. Without fresh water, without the oceans, without the forests, we are dead. It's as simple as that. There's no nice, we may survive. We are dead. We have to focus now so carefully on how we use our messaging, how we make sure that we don't get things into the, the system, like debate. There should be no debate in that word. We have to start removing words. So the key for me about giving nature voice is the, the first stage of it is what I call the equation of curiosity. It's really about, as individuals, asking questions. It's amazing to see a seven-year-old on stage who comes up here and will ask the best questions, unbridled curiosity, unbridled enthusiasm. There's no right, wrong. It's just, I want to know. I want to question. And this is, this is really the foundation of how the plastiki evolved. This is what it starts with. This is what everything that I do starts with. This is a methodology that we apply, which is very simply, dreams are the breeding grounds for adventures. Adventures percolate stories, and stories inspire more dreams. So it's that simple equation, and the whole thing is pushed through by just asking questions, just challenging the just that's the way we've done it mentality. We're so easy to just follow that path and go, well, that's how we do it. We always take plastic bags. We always take water bottles. And when, did, when did we get so thirsty that we all have to hug a water bottle? We're like the thirstiest species ever now. <laughs> it's like, what happened to us? It's like, <laughs> you know, it's just nuts. But so being curious is one of the most powerful things that we can do to start creating the change that we need to see. I think the second piece, and I just touched on it there, of that equation is storytelling. Storytelling is the most powerful medium we have. It's who we are. It's who, what we belong to. Everything we do is stories. And telling those stories, we have to get better about them. And we have to make them more engaging. And we have to believe them and be authentic and make them memorable and make them exciting and dynamic. And Plastiki was the most humbling thing I've ever been involved in. I was one person in an amazing team of people. It was totally floored me. We started with this crazy dream that was, can we take a bottle, turn it into a boat, sail across the Pacific? And that percolated out. And it was amazing to arrive. And it was great. And we arrived. And everyone was like, yay, well done. And it's brilliant. And your adventure was awesome. And it was amazing. And it was very self-indulgent in some way, because you, you, you've got to live on the ocean for four months, and people pat you on the back. It's not like I've cracked DNA. I wish I'd got off the boat and there was no plastic, but it's still here. And one of the things that we're seeing now with messaging is what, I, what was phrased by um, Federer, who's, who basically said, you know, we're in an age of slacktivism. And I, I really believe that. I came off plastic and we've got, oh yeah, I went to your website, that's cool. Now. And they're carrying a water bottle or they're holding a plastic bag. And so you start to question this. You go, how do we get out of slacktivism? which is basically this sort of, you know, the 140 characters to get your cause out there. Let's just get it out there, 140 characters. Yep, got it, and next. You know, it's like we're all under peer pressure. Who's on Facebook? Probably a lot of you here. And every day you get a new cause for something, and you just go, I better be involved. I don't want to be the guy who's out there not, like, signing up to stop puppies getting killed or whatever it is. And you just click on these buttons. But do you ever go to the website afterwards? Do you ever do anything in your real life? So for me, there's a, there's a, there's a real challenge that we all face whenever you create a campaign. It's like, how do you take that first step. How do you move awareness into actionism? And for me, there's three touch points. Imagination, fun, and collaboration. And if we can work on those three pieces, any campaign you decide to start, anything that you decide I want to get involved in, I guarantee will be a success. The best thing about imagination is it's free. You don't have to pay for it. The days of big marketing budgets around campaigns, it's free. You just have to have a little idea and be, and be able to go and take that first step. Things like public installations. I love this. Eco graffiti, you know, or green graffiti is just insane. It's like you're, you're not going to get in trouble. You're cleaning up, <laughs> right? It's just, it's just great. This was in San Fran. This I love, which is green graffiti. You literally are just spraying moss to percolate on walls. It's just insane how cool it is. These are some artists based out of the, of the UK, Dan and Heather Ackroyd. They really took tackling nature defiancy to a whole new level and started encasing these concrete blocks with, with, with greenery and started to say, how do we actually get people to recognize that nature is in our system, that the urban jungle is a jungle. It is part of nature, the concrete, the buildings. And so it just comes from those little bits of imagination. Fun to me has to be fun. For so long as environmentalists, we've been really boring. We've walked around like this. 
yep, I'm saving the planet. Mm, mm, mm. It's awful. Oh, dear. Is, oh, yeah, I want to join your gang. Yeah, wicked. That looks amazing. I want to be part of your gang. The really po-faced, like, the world is nigh gang. I mean, like, really, when you look at what people are, you know, connecting to, they're connecting to entertainment, they're connecting to friends, they're connecting to, you know, things that empower them, enrich them, make them happier. And this is, this is a little video of an example of how fun has been used to get people to think about recycling in a really cool way. This was actually shot for a, um, it was an advertising campaign for a, an unnamed car company, so I've edited that out because we don't want to promote car companies. Obviously, unless you're a squirrel, then you can, you know, promote <laughs> car companies. Um, so this is a really cool little, like, this is where imagination and fun combine to create something really cool. So you can see that it's like having fun. A that, that hundred times that was used. It's something so simple, something so just engaging. Um, the, 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 the final thing I want to sort of talk about was collaboration. So we have, in, we have sort of inspiration through just imagination. We have fun with our, our campaigns. But also now we're living in an age of what I call, we have weapons of mass distribution. I mean, Twitter is like a rocket launcher of content. It's just like, and you can fire stuff out there. But don't be confused, though, that, you know, just to put it into context, everyone thinks Twitter is like the biggest thing ever, and it's 50 million tweets a day, 287 million emails sent a day. So don't ignore some of those other roots. But Twitter now has exploded. And one of the things I've, I'm getting excited by and I see is one of the most important kind of combinations of these things when you're thinking about campaigns is this idea of location-based software. So we're seeing a lot more now of people using their mobile phones to gather audiences, to gather groups of people. So flash mobbing is a really good way of getting some stuff done. I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to show you the video, but go online and look at it. This was an Antwerp station. They did a... Well, maybe I'll run it. So they took Antwerp station and they started just blasting the sound of music into Antwerp station and organized for people to turn up and start dancing, right? Which was brilliant. So it's totally pointless, but it's a great example, right? A great example of how you can get people together to do some great things. So these guys started, all of a sudden you had 200 people, they'd all used location-based software, they'd gather themselves together. This video, by the way, was seen by 19 million people, right? It takes very little to organize, costs nothing, and all of a sudden you've got the whole of Antwerp station turned into a musical, right? It's incredible, fun imagination. So if you take that, and I'm going to cut through this, but if you take that, we can start to see people doing some extraordinary things using flash mobbing. Things like Gorilla Gardeners are coming out. This was an amazing one the other day, the New York Street advertising takeover. They figured out that there was just loads of places that were illegal advertising. And so basically they ended up covering them up and, and, and repainting them with artists. So getting like, the enthusiasm going through creativity and art. So when it comes to plastic pollution, very simply, if you're thinking today, if you're here today, if you're inspired today, you're thinking about starting something, the first thing I'd say is go and see, obviously, the Plastic Pollution Coalition. Diana Cohen and her group have done the most incredible thing to bring everybody together. But I'd also like to use this opportunity to say maybe the 6th of November should become the International Fishing for Plastic Day, oh. right? Where we make this an official day where we go out there and we make the first eco sport in the world where you grab your rod today and you go out and you win points for picking up those styrofoams, those bottle caps, those bottles. And maybe together in this audience, I have no idea where the campaign could go, how it could start, but maybe it's something that as a group we could collaborate on, we could have fun with, and we can use our imagination. So to finish off, I think you always should finish a lecture. This is a tip for lectures. Always finish with a quote from somebody much smarter than you. Because uh, everyone goes, that was great. Um, Buckminster Fuller, who basically said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Thank you very much.